the least of us, to have great impact in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we spent several weeks looking at the first movement that I studied this summer in Germany, the Moravian movement. And last week we took a little bit of a detour, got away from the three movements I studied and focused on St. Olaf in Norway. This week we go to the second movement that I looked at, um, a guy named Hans Nielsen Hauge, a peasant farmer in Norway, who will end up being the most influential person religiously, economically, and socially in Norway in the early 1800s because of an encounter he's going to have with the Holy Spirit. And the reason I chose the reading about Elisha is what was Elisha doing when he was called to be a prophet? He was out doing what? Plowing. Plowing. That's exactly what Hans Nielsen Hauge is out doing. He's about a 25-year-old peasant farmer. He's out plowing, and he has a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. So you can skip the next one, which is the plow. And actually, there's one of his biographies is the prophet behind the plow. So if you want to read a little bit about him, that's one way. The next one. As he was out plowing that day, he had an encounter, a powerful encounter with God, where he basically felt like he wasn't even in his body anymore. He felt like there was such a sense of the supernatural around him. Basically what he wrote was, I felt something supernatural, divine, and blessed. There was a glory that no man can, can describe. And um, so he's having this experience out there plowing in the field in Norway. And you know the next one. As he, as God got his attention, the thing that he sensed that God was saying to him was this. You shall confess my name before the people, exhort them to repent, and seek me while I can be found. Call on me when I'm near, and am touching their hearts. So is this just a sort of passing experience he went home and forgot about? You go to the next one. No, he actually was completely undone for three weeks where basically he didn't want to eat, he didn't want to drink, he didn't want to sleep. All he wanted to do was soak in God's love and read the Bible for three weeks. And let's go to the next one. But there was something about what happened to him that people saw something different in him. They sensed something different in him. And they wanted to have what he had. And the first people he impacted were his siblings. So within a matter of a couple days, all of his siblings had had this encounter with God after Hans went home that day after plowing. And not only that, but even though I said he was basically off reading the Bible and praying, that whenever there was a, a guest that came to the house, Hans wanted to go and be where the guest was so he could do what? Tell him about Jesus. Tell him about his encounter with God. Which means he's just your normal Lutheran. Just every opportunity we have to share our faith with someone, that's what we do, right? Um, so what's going to end up happening is whenever people have a powerful encounter with God, do, do people just maintain that same level for the rest of their life, or does something sometimes happen? Oftentimes the, uh, the peaks end up having valleys that come quickly after. So Hauge is going to have this experience where for a while he's going to tell everybody about God. He's going to tell everybody about his experience. And then as people start thinking he's crazy, as people start being annoyed by him, he gradually starts getting worn down and he gets to the place. Um, let's go to the next one. He gets to the place where he's discouraged. And he it comes to the place where he says, God, this is hard work. People aren't listening to me. This is frustrating. I just want to die. This guy who had just had this powerful experience with God, that never happens in the Bible, right? Where God, people have powerful experiences with God and soon after they want to die. Who are some examples? We have Moses. I mean, he sees all of the miracles in Egypt and provision in the wilderness. And then he comes to the point where he says, God, I didn't choose this job. If this is the way it's going to be, I just want to die. And who's another example? Jonah. Jonah, yep, just let me die, Jonah. Um, and also, uh, Elijah. Elijah's going to call down fire on Mount Carmel, defeat all the prophets of Baal, and as soon as he hears a little threat from Queen Jezebel, God, I'm the only one left, I just want to die. And so as Hauge is talking to God, he hears God speak back to him. And basically this is part of what he heard God speak to him. And God will talk to him about these people in the Bible who wanted to give up. And so that first line I thought was interesting. 
God says, do you really want to die and so benefit sin in the future? Basically, that's a good question. When we want to just give up sharing our faith and being a blessing to others, what's the perspective? The perspective is who will not be impacted in a good way because of our faithfulness to God if we end up giving in to our own frustration, our own sense of wanting to give up. So how he ends up hearing, that, having this encounter with God where, God where God says, do you really want to help the devil in the future? And how he, at the end of it, says, since then I've neither prayed to be released from my call nor to die unless it pleased the Lord. And apparently it never pleased the Lord after that point because he never asks to die, at least in any of the writings that he does. And he ends up becoming courageous even when he is frustrated. Even when I, I did the reading about about Saul and Ananias, because what is Ananias' message to Saul? Go and tell him that this calling is not going to be easy. He's going to suffer for the sake of my name. And what's going to happen to Haugi? It's not going to be easy. He's going to end up suffering for the sake of, of Jesus' name as well. And just as a lot of Saul's suffering is from the church leaders of the day, that's exactly what's going to happen to Haugi as well. He's going to suffer because of the church leaders of the day in Norway. So, what he's going to do after that experience, you go to the next one, is he's going to go and be an evangelist. He's going to go and tell people about Jesus. But in that day and age, where do you go and preach? Well, you're supposed to preach in the church, right? But were lay people allowed to preach in the church of that day? No, you had to be ordained. So, how he didn't have enough access to go and preach in the church. So, what solution did he find that... Wesley and Whitfield did a few decades before that. He preached outside of the church. Another one of his autobiographies is Pulpit Under the Sky. Gives a picture of where his influence was. As he was outside preaching because that's where he could preach. But his influence as well was inside, not in the church building, but he ended up having a lot of influence as he went and visited people. And because his reputation preceded him, um, when he went to visit someone, the word got out and all of a sudden the house was full of all kinds of people wanting to come and hear what he had to say. So he would have influence both out in big public meetings and in houses as people gathered. And his impact would just continue to grow. Next one. So did he just, was he just the normal everyday Lutheran talking about faith with people all the time? I'm joking. <laughs> Or do you think he actually told other people that that's what they should do as well? Basically, his message was, anytime you have a conversation with someone, talk about Jesus. That was the advice that he gave. So, just good, normal, Norwe or Nor Norwegian Lutheran conversation. Not. Um, so, at the same time he's encouraging lay people to share their faith, he's criticizing the clergy. Because the church has gotten a little bit dry, a little bit dead. And the clergy, he just says, are not making a real clear message to the people. So, do you think that's going to help him as he travels around Norway if, if the Lutheran clergy are basically reading his books and hearing that they're speaking against, he's speaking against them? And that's going to be part of his problem. But he is going to have an impact. You can go to the next one. His impact, I went to Norway with the intent of walking 120 miles um, just to get a flavor of walking through Norway to connect with what Hans Nielsen Hauge did. I only went 45 before my Achilles decided to tell me to stop. But um, Hans Nielsen Hauge went a little bit further than 120 miles around Norway. He was estimated to have walked over 10,000 miles around Norway. And what I discovered while I was there is it's not flat either. So it wasn't 10,000 miles of flat walking. It was probably a lot of up and down walking. So as he traveled around Norway, he basically hit every geographic area from north to south of Norway and had some sort of impact all over the, the nation of Norway. And not only did he travel, but he wrote books. And like I said, some of those books got him in trouble because of what he said about some of the leadership. But as he wrote books, it was estimated that over 100,000 people in what was then a, a nation of 900,000 people or so read his books. And that was a time when probably a lot of people couldn't read, so that's a pretty high percentage of the population being impacted by what he had to say. So he's going to have a huge impact in the early 1800s in Norway. But once again, he couldn't preach in the churches, and so he preached in public and he encouraged other lay preaching. Uh, radical. That was what 
part of his, his thing was, you know what, all of us should be preaching. All of us should be sharing our faith with each other, uh, which wasn't the normal Norwegian Lutheran way of doing things. So he's going to have some other challenges other than the fact he can't preach in the church building. The first is called the Conventicle Act. And basically what that said is it's illegal for farmers to gather and have public meetings. I don't know if they were worried that the farmers would create riots and problems. But that was the social class that Hauge came from. He was a peasant farmer. And so as he traveled, a lot of his impact was meeting and talking to peasant farmers. So when there's a law that says peasant farmers aren't supposed to create groups for anything, what do you think some of those local clergy did when they started to see groups of farmers gathering around Hauke? They called the authorities and had him shut down or arrested. Another law that didn't help him a whole lot was the Vagrancy Act. That in that day and age they wanted to keep order, so they wanted to make sure the peasants weren't just itinerantly wandering through the nation. So they wanted to make sure the peasants stayed close to home. So basically it was illegal as a peasant to travel too far away from home. So what's another thing that the leaders that didn't like what he was saying could say? You know what, this guy's from southern Norway, he shouldn't be here. You should arrest him. And so he ends up, you go to the next one. At one point he'll end up being in prison for about seven years. And they never really do come up with any good charges against him. And he just never really gets a fair trial. But physically he gets beaten up to the point where he's never physically the same person after he's been in prison for that many years. Um, so a lot of his post-prison impact is not going to be as big because of his health issues. But one of the things about him is his encounter with God doesn't just affect Norway religiously. It's going to affect Norway economically as well. The, what's happening about his lifetime is the time that Dan the Denmark is losing control over Norway. Sweden's going to step in and take some control over Norway. But Norway's starting to move toward independence at this point. And um, so what's happening is that in 1814, uh, if anybody has Norwegian background out here, what, what is Sitten de Mai, 17th of May? Does anybody know what that is? It's Independence Day. More, more specifically, it's Norwegian Constitution Day. Because Norway is not going to become an independent country until 1905, I think. But they're going to write their constitution in 1814. Um, and I'm going to get to that later because I just realized I skipped a point. Um, but the economic impact. Hauke is going to be someone who, by nature, he's an entrepreneur. Um, so he's going to be the kind of person who starts things, he sees opportunities, he ends up empowering people to do things. So as he travels, he is one of the biggest causes for economic advancement in Norway. Because as he travels, he learns about farming methods in one area that work well, and he travels to the next area and he shares that farming method. He learns about some industry opportunities in one area, he shares that when he goes to the next area. So as he goes around Norway, he's bringing economic revival to Norway, in addition to renewal of the church. And one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to want to support the people that he sees doing ministry in areas. So he's going to even start factories and he's going to start businesses as he travels so that they can have income to keep doing their ministry. He's going to write lots of books and the people that normally would print books don't like him. So he'll end up getting his own paper factory and his own printing factory, printing press. So he's going to end up economically affecting Norway in powerful ways. And the, the class that he's most powerfully going to affect is the peasant class. He's going to lift them up by helping them to see opportunities and helping them to see that they weren't just to be trampled down but to be lifted up. So that's the economic impact. But he's not just going to have religious impact and economic impact. He's going to have cultural impact. So like I said, 1814 was when Norway is going to be writing their, their constitution. And a lot of their constitution is going to be about empowering the normal lower class people. And who do you think will be several of the people who will be writing that constitution? People who are affected by? Hauge. So he, lots of his friends, lots of the people he impacts will be the one writing the Norwegian constitution. So he's going to have an impact even in the whole development of the nation of Norway. Um, but do you think he's only going to have impact? Let's, yeah, let's... Do you think he's only going to have impact within Norway? 
One thing that I discovered when I visited where my great-grandparents came from, uh, they were from gorgeous areas with fjords and mountains, but there wasn't a lot of uh, farmable territory. So back in the mid-1800s, what I learned was from a lot of those most beautiful areas, a third to a half of the population would end up emigrating to the United States. So, if this is the period that people are being impacted by this pietistic movement through Hans Nielsen Hauge, where do you think some of this movement will start impacting in the middle 1800s? It's going to come to the United States. So, how many of you have Norwegian Lutheran background out here? I see a couple of you anyway. That a lot of that, that spirit that helped to plant the churches as, as our ancestors came to the United States was this spirit of the pietists, the spirit of it shouldn't just be the clergy telling us what to do, but it should be each of us having our own relationship with God. It should be a lot of, at least where I came from in Iowa, the congregations were not hierarchy based, they were more congregational, because it was a sense that everybody, it should be the normal members of the church that should be doing the ministry. And a lot of it came from that background. So he's gonna have an impact religiously, economically and culturally. But what do we learn? Let's go to the next one. That when I talked about the Moravians, and part of the reason I did this was to look at our mission statement as the church, that we're to be connecting upward with God, inward with each other, and outward in impacting the world. And we discovered that when this group of refugees in Germany had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, it caused them to connect upward powerfully in prayer and worship, caused them to connect inwardly, powerfully in communities, small groups, and it caused them to be the greatest missionary sending force of that time. What do you think might happen as God impacts this guy in Norway? It's going to impact the worship life and the prayer life of Norway. It's going to push people upward. He's going to lift the level of both of those things in a church that's getting a little bit dry. What else is it going to do? It's going to get people who are used to just going to church and listening to the pastor getting together in small groups in each other's houses and having prayer meetings. What else is it going to do? The, impact, the, the movement that starts with Hauge is going to begin the Norwegian mission movement, where most of the missionaries sent out by Norway are going to be from this stream of the church. So what I want to encourage us to think about is, I think we're at a time when our church is getting dry. I think we're at a time when the stream of our church is getting very shallow. And that even when I grew up 30 years ago, there were a lot more streams in the Lutheran church. There were more of the pietists, there were more of the charismatics, there were more of these other streams coming together, making our church richer. And over time, it seems like we've become just the liberal Lutheran church in the United States. I don't want to say, I don't want to be political, but I do want to say, I think that we've become shallow. I think we were at the place where Norway was in the early 1800s, because all the churches were basically just focused on intellectual stuff. I think we're at a place where we need to have some Hans Nielsen Hauge step up, who have encounters with God, who lift up people. And that's what I want to look at what we learn. That, that encounter that he had, early in his life he didn't feel very confident about his faith. He didn't feel that God could love him. But after he had this encounter while, while plowing, he felt the love of God, and that's what motivated him from the inside. So maybe what we need to do as a church is create an opportunity for people to not just be told what to do and learn the right things in their head, but to experience more of what God wants to do in our hearts. Another thing that I see in his life is that he was someone who lifted people up. He came from the peasant class, and he lifted up the peasants. He lifted up businesses wherever he went. He lifted up society. And I think that's part of the impact that we're called to have, is that because the church is here, that people who are trying to sense God's call for their life should be able to hear it more clearly. That we should help people to follow the call to go out and start a business. Or we should help people to hear God's voice and if they're being led to do something um, to make a difference in their community. That we're here to lift people up that businesses should be better off, our church should be stronger because we're here. The business community should be better because we're here. Um, and society should be better because we're here. Not because of this sense that we're over and above everyone telling them what to do, 
but because we've experienced God lifting us up. So the last one, the last picture, there's that person standing in front of a building in Norway. Um, it's interesting because I went to Hauke's house, which is where the museum was, and you'd think this guy who was the most powerful impact religiously, economically, and culturally in Norway would have this big, huge museum with hundreds of people visiting it. But actually it was a house that was even hard to find with Google Maps. And it was this house where it was just one lady who lived in half of it, who would go and do tours, and then make waffles, and we'd sit down and eat waffles afterwards. Um, it was, we were the only people looking at it that day. And um, so, what does it say about, well, the Moravians? They turned the world upside down but never became famous. People are more likely to know John Wesley than the Moravians, but they're the reason that he became John Wesley. Um, a lot of people don't know about Hans Nielsen Hauge, um, but yet he turned Norway upside down in the early 1800s. So maybe we as a church need to be focusing not so much on are we the biggest church in the neighborhood or have the biggest sign or the, uh, the greatest programs, Maybe we just need to be people who come together as peasants, praying together, hearing God's call to go out and do missions, praying for each other, helping each other to hear God's calling in your life, to say, God, is, help me to hear what I'm, what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Maybe we're called to have impact, whether we have our name known or not, and that somehow people will just look and see, well, I don't know about resurrection, but I do know that the people that hang out with resurrection people seem to be better. And the communities where resurrection is seems to be better. And so may we, as a church, seek not so much to just learn the right stuff and follow the right rules, but to ask God to come and meet us where we are so that God can transform us from the inside so that somehow the world around us is a better place. Amen. Thank you.